Would you please uh, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 7 if you would like to follow along in the reading of the Word, which I would recommend if you have your Bibles. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 16, but I would like to read for you again the account beginning in verse 1. Acts chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. Luke, uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this. And the high, pri the high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, that is Stephen, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, Depart from your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he departed from the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And from there, after his father died, God removed him into this country in which you are now living. And he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him. But God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they shall be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph, and sold him into Egypt. And yet God was with him, and rescued him from all his afflictions, and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan, and a great affliction with it and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent word and invited Jacob and his father and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there passed away he and our fathers. And from there they were removed to Shechem, and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Well, so ends the reading of God's word. May he again bless this part of his word to our hearing this morning. Now last week we saw the circumstances of Stephen's arrest, that God had given to him power, power to preach, power to bear witness to that gospel by performing many uh, uh, miraculous things, many signs and wonders. We saw that this attracted the attention of certain Hellenistic Jews that were arguing with him, that they were unable to refute his assertions regarding Jesus, and they conspired to bring false charges against him, which they did, turning the people's opinion and having him arrested. Now we also saw the charges that were made against him and the beginning of his defense. They had charged him with blasphemy against Moses and God. Now the reason why they charged him with blaspheming God is because God was the one who gave Moses the things that he had to give to them. And if you're speaking against Moses and the customs which he had handed down, you're speaking against God. Well, Stephen had said that Jesus was going to destroy the temple. He was going to alter the customs handed down by Moses, which meant, of course, the ceremonial law. Now this was true but they didn't understand really what he meant. They thought that Stephen was saying that this Jesus was going to destroy something that had been handed down by God, something that was still in force, something that was still necessary in order for their relationship with God. But what Stephen actually meant was that Jesus had fulfilled these things and their purpose was finished. Their time was at an end. And that these Jews needed to see that and they needed to embrace the reality, Jesus Christ, and move beyond the shadows because those who continued to trust in those shadows and continued to cling to them would ultimately be destroyed in 70 AD when God finally put an end to them. 
Now, in his defense, of course, of the gospel, in his defense against their false charges, Stephen begins to survey the beginnings of the Jewish nation to point out some very important details that would prove their charges were false and that they needed to abandon the things they were holding on to. The first thing he mentioned, of course, was Abraham's idolatrous background. Remember that Abraham was not chosen because he was necessarily pure apart from God's grace. He would have been an idolater like anyone else. But God called him out of the idolatry of Ur of the Chaldees and uh, called him apart to be the one he would make his covenant with purely by his grace. I believe through that that Stephen was warning them that they should not reject Jesus Christ. By rejecting him, they reject the true God. And they're actually returning to the idolatry from which he had originally saved Abraham. Secondly, he addresses the possession of the land, which they thought was so important that it was not that God's relationship depended upon that land as they thought. Because again, when God promised the land to Abraham, he did not give it to them right away. And yet Abraham had a relationship with God, and, and the patriarchs had a relationship with God, and God's people had a relationship with him, even when they were in Egypt. Remember that though God had promised to give him all of Canaan, Abraham never really possessed even a foot of it as an inheritance. He did buy a, a small plot of land in which to, to bury his, his wife and in which he was buried, but he hadn't yet received any of the inheritance which God had promised, which was all of the land. As a matter of fact, his children would not receive it for about another 400 years. God had promised that he was going to give it to his children, and yet he did not possess it. And yet wasn't Abraham a child of God? Wasn't Abraham called the friend of God? Salvation, this relationship with God, was not tied to the land, nor was it tied to the temple, which would come many years later, nor was it tied to the ceremonial law that regulated the temple worship, the things that the Jews were holding on to. It was tied to what all these things were pointing to. The temple was pointing to the sacrifice of Christ. The ceremonial law and all the sacrifices were pointing to his sacrifice. The land was actually pointing to heaven, which Jesus opened the door to through his sacrifice. Well, finally, Stephen pointed to the covenant of circumcision that God had made with Abraham. And Stephen brought up this point perhaps to, to, to again show that Abraham was in covenant with God even before circumcision. And so to trust in circumcision was also foolish. Abraham was saved apart from it. It's not circumcision that saves you. Paul made this same argument from Romans chapter 4. No one is saved by being related to Abraham. No one is saved by possessing the land. No one is saved by the temple or through the ceremonial law or through circumcision. The only way that anyone is saved is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, all that these things were pointing to. The seed of Abraham. The one who gave his life as an atonement for sin. The once for all sacrifice that alone can remove sin. The one who circumcises the heart of those who believe. Not through the circumcision of the flesh, but the circumcision of the spirit, which our Lord Jesus Christ accomplishes through his life and through his death. Through the one who brings us into the true land of promise, heaven itself. It's only through Christ that anyone can be saved. And again, those are the implications of what Stephen has said up to this point. Now this morning we move into the second part of his argument. Having begun with the origin of the Jewish race, he now begins to trace out God's covenant dealings with his people. And what he reveals in, in these different aspects, and there are many different things he might have chosen as he goes through here, but the things that he chooses are not the most flattering side of Jewish history. Not one of faith, but rather uh, one of disobedience, one of unbelief. Now certainly the Lord did raise up believers in the Old Testament. Certainly there were mighty men and women of faith but there are also a number of people, the majority of them, that rejected those that were following God and rejected God. We see a pattern emerging here among the Jews, one of persecution, persecuting the deliverers that God raises up for them at different points within their history. A pattern of rebellion 
against the commandments of God, a pattern even of idolatry on the part of God's people, the things that the Jews, the Jewish leaders were guilty of at that very moment. Because at the end of this whole argument, Stephen is going to basically indict the Jews. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You, have, who, you who have received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. You see, this is the climax of his whole argument. And now as he goes on to explain the history of Israel, he's pointing out examples of where they do that very thing. So all of these patterns that he reveals, Stephen would say that these are not only revealed in their fathers when they actually possessed the land, but it was also among them when they were in exile and when they were brought back into the land and now that they are in the land. A pattern of sin, of disobedience, and of rejecting God's purpose and his Messiah's, especially the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ had his own commentary on the, uh, on the Jewish nation during the days of his ministry. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46, we have the parable of the vineyard, which is simply a picture of how God's people uh, generally dealt with uh, the, the prophets, the, uh, the, again, the, the deliverers, the messiahs, as it were, that the Lord had raised up in history. Remember how the Lord had planted a vineyard was the nation of Israel. But every time he sent his servants who were the prophets to collect the produce or the spiritual fruit of obedience, they were always turned away. They were mistreated. They were thrown out of the vineyard. That's the way that God's people, covenant people, dealt with God's prophets. Finally, he sent his son, saying they will respect my son. But when they saw him, they said, this is the heir. Let us kill him and throw him out of the vineyard, and then the vineyard will be ours. Now, is it any wonder that our Lord Jesus Christ pronounced a curse upon the nation, saying, therefore, God is going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to a nation that will produce its fruit? Is it any wonder that God was bringing that nation to an end in AD 70 and taking out of their hands everything that they trusted in, the temple and the temple service? These men were acting just like their forefathers, and as their forefathers, they would be judged. Now this morning, Stephen gives to us, um, at least in the portion that we're reading, uh, one example. And that uh, is the example, of course, of Joseph. And as he outlines this, he gives us basically three things. First of all, God's faithfulness. He is blessing Abraham's seed, as he promised that he would. But secondly, we see the persecution of that seed. How when there, there comes a time where there is a danger that God wants to deliver his people from, he raises up a man in order to deliver them, but they reject him. And he is persecuted and thrown out by them, even as, of course, the Jews did to Jesus. But finally, we see how the Lord takes that seed and raises him up as a deliverer to deliver his people. Well, first of all, let's consider the Lord's blessing on Abraham's seed in verse 8. Luke writes, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. Now, I want to remind you that the last time we were uh, looking at this text, we sort of overlapped into the issue of circumcision. And we saw that the Lord had given to Abraham the covenant of circumcision, the sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. And that sign was very important because it meant that God had made certain promises to Abraham, that he was going to be a God to him, that he was going to be with him and take care of him, that he was going to give him the land and that he was going to multiply his offspring and bring them into the land and that through that seed that eventually all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But at the same time, circumcision also called those who possessed it to certain responsibilities. That's one thing that I think we seem to miss uh, with, with the covenant of circumcision. Uh, 
we look at the blessing that God promises, and that's good. I mean, we need to look at that, but we also need to see what it called those who received it too. He says to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. By the way, that's the same thing that baptism calls us to be. It calls us to have a renewed heart. It calls us to put off the old man and to put on the new. It calls us, again, to walk before the Lord in the strength which Jesus Christ supplies and be perfect. But it's really to this that the Jews back then, that they would fail over and over again. They would not obey the Lord. Now again, we see the Lord fulfilling his promise to Abraham that he would begin to multiply his children as the stars of heaven. And again, Abraham believed that promise, even though in his lifetime he saw but one child. I think he may have, uh, let's see, he may have lived to the birth of the others. I forget offhand. But yet he believed God's promise. And so he had Isaac. And on the eighth day he was circumcised, which means that Isaac was brought into that covenant as well. God was his God, and this was one of his people. And he was bound by those same, uh, those same requirements, walk before me and be blameless. And so on down the line, Isaac had Jacob, and of course Esau, uh, by Rebekah. But of course we're not focusing on Esau here. And Jacob had the twelve patriarchs. Again, God multiplied Abraham. It was under very difficult circumstances. If you remember the case of Jacob, Jacob had to meet with a few difficulties before he received these twelve fine sons. He had to flee from the promised land to go to Paddan Aram because he stole his brother's blessing and Esau wanted to kill him. He had to work for seven years for Rachel and then of course when the seven years were up he got Leah instead. And then he had to work another seven years in order to get Rachel. With, among his wives they began to fight over how many children they had because they wanted to win their husband's affections and in the process they even gave their maids to Jacob as wives. So, Jacob ends up with four wives and twelve daughters, or excuse me, twelve sons and, and one daughter. And then we read that he, in going back to the land, his father-in-law pursued him and wanted to injure him, perhaps kill him. And then, of course, Esau would have killed him when he came back if the Lord had not intervened, but the Lord did, and he arrived safely. Now, this reminds us that God always fulfills his promises. God promised that he was going to multiply Abraham, he is multiplying Abraham, but those promises often come with some kind of struggle or some kind of price that is involved. But God will always fulfill his promises, even though we live a very difficult life. And when God fulfills those promises, it will be worth it. The weight will be worth it, the difficulties that we have to endure. Now, God was multiplying Abraham's seed and once they were in the land, he would continue to multiply them, even though as yet they still not, do not possess the land. That was still many, several hundred years off. But next we see, I think, the main point of this, which is the persecution of Abraham's seed. Both the one that is persecuted and the ones who are doing the persecution are all of Abraham's seed. We read in verses 9 and 10. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Yet God was with him and rescued him from all his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now again, we descend into Joseph, the account of Joseph, and the reasons for this persecution. Why is it that the brothers hated Joseph? Well, first of all, because his father loved him more than he loved the others. Because after all, Joseph was one of the two sons that his most beloved wife, Rachel, bore before she died in childbirth with Benjamin. Secondly, because in his display of affection upon his son, the father had given him a very special gift, which was that coat of many colors. Thirdly, the brothers hated Joseph because he always told his father the truth about them. Remember how Joseph brought back a bad report concerning them and they hated him all the more for it. Again, those who do what is right will be persecuted. Some look at Joseph as a spoiled brat and, and you know, somehow he was doing the wrong things, but I think he was doing the right thing, right? I mean, his, his father sent him out to find out how they were doing and he came back and told him the truth. You know, what's wrong with that, right? But fourthly, and I think most importantly, they hated him because he had dreams, 
dreams that sin, seemed to indicate that one day his brothers who were older than him would, would bow down before him along with his father and his mother. Now Rachel was already dead but probably refers to uh, Leah because she, even though she would not be his mother, would still be a stepmother, which the Bible would, would call as, you know, would, would refer to as mother. They hated him because of this affection his father had. They hated him because he told the truth. They hated him because of his dreams. But you know, there's also something going on behind the scenes that we need to recognize. They hated him because it was a part of God's plan that they would hate him enough to move him out of the area, right? God is absolutely sovereign in these things. It was God's plan to bring Joseph into Egypt where eventually he would be able to save them from the common or the coming famine. But the net result of all of this is that the brothers hated him enough. And remember who Joseph is. He is the one through whom God is going to deliver his people. They hated him enough to want to kill him. And one day they had their opportunity. His father sent him to check on the welfare of the brothers. Go see how your brothers are doing. And when they saw him coming, they said, here comes that troublemaker. Let's kill him and make up a story. Tell our father, get, get, get ourselves out of trouble, but get rid of this guy once and for all. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says they would have succeeded if Reuben had not talked them out of it. He says, don't kill him. He's our flesh and blood. What is God going to do to us if we do this? And so they said, well, you know what? If we kill him, we're not really going to profit from his death. Why don't we sell him to these Midianite traders instead? And so they lifted Joseph out of the pit and they sold him to the Midianite traders who then sold him to an Egyptian official, Potiphar. And as you know, Potiphar, while he was serving in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife began to desire Joseph, but he refused. And so she cried out, got him in trouble, and he ended up in prison. Again, going through humiliation, God's deliverer, being thrown into a pit, being sold as a slave, being serving as a slave, being falsely accused, and now he's in prison. But it was in prison that the Lord brought the chief butler and the chief baker, gave them the dreams, Joseph interpreted the dreams, so that he was well known as one who could do that when Pharaoh had the dream God gave to him so that, again, he could interpret Pharaoh's dream and that would bring about his rise to power in Egypt and put him in a position where he could help his family. His brothers persecuted Joseph. They hated him. What they did to him, they meant for evil. But God meant it for good. But again, the key is, look at the disposition of the patriarchs against the deliverer God had raised up for them. Now finally, we see the deliverance of Abraham's seed in verses 11 through 15. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction with it. And our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. On the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob his father and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all, and Jacob went down to Egypt. Now again, God sent Joseph ahead of them in order to deliver them. God brought a famine, and he allowed Joseph and Egypt to get ready for it through the dream he had given to Pharaoh. Now remember that the Lord brought this about both to raise Joseph up and to make him a savior to his household because that, that lack of food compelled Joseph's brothers to go into Egypt since, of course, they heard there was food there. The Lord had blessed Egypt. The Lord had given to Egypt a seven years of a, of a plentiful harvest so there would be plenty of food for the seven years of famine that were to follow. And so God was preparing a place for them there. Joseph was sent ahead to prepare a place for God's people so that when the danger came, they would be kept safe. When they were there the first time, Joseph told them they could not come back a second time unless Benjamin was with them. And the second time they came back, remember he put the cup in Benjamin's sack so he would have a reason to accuse Benjamin and keep him there. And it was at that point that he began to see a change in his brothers, especially where the one Judah had made himself a surety for Benjamin, breaks down and says, you can't keep Benjamin because if you do, his father will 
will die. And as Joseph sees their repentance, he begins then, or he reveals himself to them, invites them to come to Egypt, and they are saved from the famine. Again, the one they rejected becomes the deliverer, the one that God has raised up in order to save them from that danger, from the famine. And again, the last thing we see is more evidence of this change of heart. Sometimes we look at the actions of the patriarchs, these uh, 11 brothers of Joseph, or at least 10 of them, because Benjamin wasn't really involved in that scheme. And we wonder, were these men really repentant? Were these men actually believers? Well, we see something in Stephen's account that indicates that their repentance was more than just we're caught in the act. We might get in trouble from God. God's bringing judgment now upon us because of what we did to our brother Joseph. And we see some faith there in uh, these um, verses 15 and 16 in particular, where we see, or we read, and there he and our fathers died. From there they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. It appears as though not just Jacob, but also, of course, Joseph, who gave order concerning his bones, but even all the patriarchs, believed that promise that God had made to Abraham. They believed that he was going to bring them into the land. And so they gave orders concerning their remains once they died. Now we know from the book of Genesis that Jacob was buried with Abraham and Isaac in the cave of Machpelah, which Abraham had bought. And Joseph was buried in Shechem. And it appears from what Stephen says here that he was also buried there with his brothers. By the way, I don't want to raise this issue uh, to make a big deal of it, but from what Stephen says here, it appears as though they are all buried in the same place. That Abraham was the one who purchased this land in Shechem and that they were all buried in that same plot of land. But I already told you that Jacob was buried with Abraham and Sarah while Joseph was buried in Shechem with... Um, well, in that, in that land that Jacob had actually purchased from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. And I think the reason why Stephen relates it the way he does is the same reason why, as I explain to you all of these things and I'm summarizing, that we have to cut out a lot of the middleman kind of thing. We call those ellipses, you know, where you cut out certain parts and you kind of conflate everything together uh, just by way of summary. It may appear that that's what Stephen is saying, but I don't think that Stephen knew so little about the Old Testament that he would confuse those details. I think he's just summarizing it uh, to the point where he's leaving things out. It makes it look like others are purchasing things that when, well, as a matter of fact, it wasn't Abraham, but a son of Abraham that did. But we don't want to miss the main point here, and that is that there was repentance, there was reformation, and there was faith that was born in the hearts of the patriarchs. Now, in closing, I want us to just sort of draw all this together and see what Stephen's purpose was in saying all these things. Well, first of all, God blessed Abraham and his seed and brought him into that covenant with himself, bound them to this perfect and perpetual obedience. But instead of obeying him, they actually lived as one who was not in covenant with God. They sought to kill, which was something God had forbidden but to kill the one that God had raised up to be their deliverer. And isn't this the same thing that the fathers did to all the prophets who spoke to them the word of God? Remember, Joseph, though he may not have had the office of a prophet, still had a prophetic gift. And the primary reason why they hated him was because of the visions, the dream that he had that was indicating what God was going to do. It was prophetic. It was showing the future. Remember how the, uh, you know, the, the stars all bowed down to him, how the sun, the moon, and the, the 11 stars bowed down to him. Uh, that was showing what was going to happen in the future when he was raised up in Egypt. They hated him because he was a prophet. They didn't like what he prophesied. And Stephen is saying this is something that the fathers did to all the prophets who were sent to them to turn them away from their evil ways. Jesus even rebuked them for this very thing in Matthew 23, 29 through 33. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous, 
and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Stephen is saying, this is what your forefathers did. This is what you do. And, of course, this is what you have done to Christ, who was the greatest prophet of all, that the Lord raised up and sent to you, the one he sent to deliver you from your sins. This was a part of God's plan, of course, and they were still fully responsible for their actions. If they didn't repent, they were going to perish for them. But what Stephen is doing is drawing a connection between the way their forefathers lived and the way that they are living. Your fathers were rebellious and you're doing exactly the same thing. Your fathers hated the one that God raised up to deliver you. And you've done exactly the same thing. God raised up Jesus to deliver you. You have hated him. You have rejected him. You have separated him, not just out of the land, but out of the land of the living, even as Joseph's brothers wanted to do to him. But the Lord raised him up again and sent him again to you. He's pointing out that even as the patriarchs repented, even now many of the Jews are repenting and receiving this one as their deliverer. And so obviously the question to them is, are you going to act like your forefathers? Are you going to continue to deny Jesus Christ and reject him? Are you going to continue to reject the prophets that he is sending to you, even as Jesus said, I will raise up many wise men and scribes and prophets and send them to you, and yet you're going to kill them? And because of that, all the righteous blood that's been shed on the face of the earth is going to fall on this generation. Stephen is calling them to repentance. Don't act as your forefathers. Don't continue to reject Jesus Christ, but receive him, even as the patriarchs received him, because they recognized that God had raised up Joseph to be their deliverer. Even so, you need to recognize that the one you rejected, God has raised up to be your savior. Don't act as your fathers, but receive this one that God has sent to you. Now we know already what the answer to that question is. They are still going to reject Jesus Christ. And because of that, they are going to be destroyed. However, many of the Jews will turn and believe in him. But again, that question that Stephen posed to them is the same question that God poses to us. God has also offered to us a Savior. And we have to decide how we're going to respond to it how we're going to respond to him. Are we going to act as they do, rejecting Jesus Christ, rejecting the gospel, rejecting God's deliverer and his plan for them, the only way of salvation? Or are we going to receive him as our Lord, as our Savior, as our deliverer, as our trust? Well, the Lord reminds us, as we've already seen in John chapter 14, that he is the only way, the only way we can ever be saved. And so we must receive him if we are ever to see heaven. This stands as a warning to us as it did to them and a reminder to us as well that the only way that anyone can ever be saved is through the deliverer that God has raised up and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There are not many ways of salvation. There is only one. And if we know that, how much more important is it that we trust in that one and do what we can to get that message of the gospel out to those in darkness, that they might know the way. We can't change their hearts. We can't make them believe. The only thing we can do is dispel the darkness of their ignorance. That is something we can do. And so that's something that we must do if we are to be faithful to God. That's what Stephen was seeking to do in the face of his enemies. We need to do that not only with those who might like us, but even with those who may hate us. Remember, Saul was one who persecuted the church, but once God turned his heart, he became one of the greatest advocates of the Christian faith. So the fact that somebody hates us now doesn't mean they're always going to hate us. Let's not be concerned about the objects so much as getting that message out and dispelling that darkness, because again, he is the only deliverer God has provided. Well, let's, uh, let's stop there and let's bow for a moment of prayer.
And let's ask the Lord to help us again search our hearts and encourage us again through these words to um, be those who would shine the light, even as um, Joseph did as a man of truth, even as Stephen did in the face of his enemies, without fear. Let's pray that God would make us uh, the same kind of people.